Thanks. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday IRP seminar coming to you uh, remote. We're delighted to have Chris Riddell uh, with us today, all the way from uh, our neighbors to the north in Canada. He is a professor of economics at the University of Waterloo, um, and he's going to be presenting some of his work that looks at um, the income maintenance studies and the 70s, so the sime and dime. Um, and we uh, were just chatting about how that data comes to him via uh, our own Wisconsin. So uh, very excited to hear about this work. Um, if you recall, we ask um, that if you have questions along the way, and um, as an economist, he likes to be interrupted. So please feel free to put those in the chat or the question and answer or ask um, me if I will unmute you and then we'll be able to um, interrupt him as much as he wants to be interrupted and um, ask questions. So again, just use the chat or the Q&A and um, we'll handle questions that way. And with that, Chris, um, I will give it to you to share your slides um, and take it away. Thank you. Okay. Um. So, uh, so thanks for having me. Um, I was really looking forward to this trip. So, uh, I'm, I'm still disappointed that I'm, that I'm not there, uh, but, uh, U S Canada travel remains, um, tricky. So here's the title. Uh, let, let me premise this by saying, I should say, I should, I should say two, two things. Uh, first, this is, I'm, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, when we were doing, uh, the uh, just the 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 intro here to getting the Zoom going and everything that I'm a Zoom newbie. Um, I haven't had to use Zoom for teaching. Uh, I, I believe this is my excluding this morning with the grad students. Uh, this is my so either third or fourth time using Zoom. And right now, as I mentioned, I can't see anybody in the the in the videos. So this is really bizarre. <laughs> so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that this is actually. Um, Today is the first time I have presented either, you know, teaching format like this morning with the grad students or giving a paper um, since 2019. Because uh, my university, we uh, we made. And I'm not teaching now this term, so that's part of the that's part of the reason. The other thing is we made the decision because we have so many international students, um, in particular uh, India and China. Uh, we made the decision, we mean the economics department, uh, although many of other departments made the same call, to um, to make our teaching 100% asynchronous. So um, I've only been doing uh, recorded lectures. So um, I say that because, you know, we're getting close to 2022. I haven't presented since 2019. I'm feeling rather like intimidated and, you know, out of, out of practice. Um, so there you go. I want to keep expectations really low. So, here, uh, so there's the title, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and this is, um, uh, joint work with my, uh, with my father, who's now professor emeritus from, uh, from VSE, um, at the university of British Columbia. And this is our second go through, um, having a look at, um, previous, uh, experiments. Uh, and this one's going to look at the income maintenance experiments, um, as you just heard. Okay, so the our our starting point here. Just, just this is just a little bit of uh, motivation. We're we're not actually interested in this paper in in really kind of drawing any sort of you know d direct inferences for the current debate around a basic income. Uh, but the but in terms of motivation, kind of our our starting point in going back to the income maintenance experiments was just all the attention that they have been receiving. Um, uh, due to the, the the debate around a basic income, we had a basic income experiment uh, that was started and then abandoned in Ontario, the the largest of the Canadian provinces. Um, and then we and then there's a there was I guess it's finished now um, a an expert panel done in uh, in my home province, British Columbia, that I was part of on doing an experiment, a basic income experiment in BC, which is not going to happen. Um, 
And, and then I'm sure as everyone knows here on the call, there's been, there's, there's, there's some uh, high profile experiments happening in, in different US cities and then a, a bunch in, in Europe. So um, this is a policy that is, has been getting a lot of attention the last uh, uh, few years and coming out of the pandemic, at least here in Canada, it seems to only be uh, in, increasing. Um, and so if you follow this, uh, this discussion, the income maintenance experiments from the 1970s the, the, the ones, uh, as you know, as you know, in the, the, the US, uh, New Jersey, the, the rural, and Gary, Indiana, and then Sundime. Uh, so those, those, uh, those five experiments. And then there's also a Canadian experiment, which really has been under the radar screen until, until just this basic income debate. Um, I, I've talked to lots of people that didn't even know the Canadian ex experiment existed until just the last um, few years when they've read about it. So the income main experiments, the North American income main experiments now have kind of come back into the limelight um, as kind of evidence on, on the labor supply, um, possible um, outcomes from a basic income. A basic income of, uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail unless, unless we wanna talk about it later. It might be a topic best left until the end on how a negative income tax would, would fit into a basic uh, income. There's, there's, there's uh, lots of different uh, uh, ways of basic, basic income could be implemented, but a negative income tax is one possible, um, uh, you know, format that 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 could take. Uh, but you know, our interest really is is in kind of looking back to the income maintenance experiments, given that they are now kind of um, kind of back in the the limelight. Um, so if you've read some of the basic income literature, you'll 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 know that a, a big part of those discussions have been reviews of the evidence on the NITs, uh, in particular labor um, supply. The other part of that literature um, that, uh, that I'm looking at in a different paper is on, um, is on the um, uh, marital um, outcomes. Uh, but in this paper, we're gonna be looking at labor supply. So that literature is absolutely enormous. Uh, uh, this fellow, um, Widerquist from, uh, from uh, Europe has been doing a lot of writing on the negative income tax experiments. Uh, that particular paper there is a nice summary. And uh, he went through this literature quite carefully. He comes up with more than 200 books and journal articles on the NITs uh, alone. And that's, that's essentially all US because there's only really one paper on, um, on the Canadian experiment. Um, and the I think it's fair to characterize this literature as follows. That is, that the, the, the focus has been really entirely on the labor supply response of working poor families. So we'll look at that in you know, graphical format, just using a basic labor supply model in a second. But what, what hasn't, or what struck me as, as, as odd, maybe it was because of the way I covered the negative income tax in, in um, grad labor class um, is that the, the literature didn't seem to look at or really contemplate um, the effects of the negative income tax on, um, on welfare recipients. So individuals, you know, uh, not working or working very little, we expect to see at that time period, uh, if you uh, have your labor history there, um, at that time period, we had um, we didn't have 100% tax uh, rate on work for AFDC um, recipients in the U.S. Um, that policy was changed, I guess, in the late 60s. It didn't last very long. It was changed back in the 80s, but but um, that did exist. Now in Canada, we did have 100% um, tax rate on labor earnings, uh, but not in the U.S. And then and then the U.S. also had, and this was the case in Canada as well, at least in the province that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, there was also an earnings disregard. So we expect maybe a little bit of, uh, of work among the welfare recipient uh, group. Uh, I'm gonna show you those numbers, of course, soon. Um, but that particular part of the participant, uh, you know, sample in these experiments uh, hasn't really been examined. And if we go back to the early literature on the negative on uh, a negative income tax proposal, so like uh, in particular the the starting point of it, so uh, Friedman, nineteen sixty two, 
but also some of what Robert Moffat's uh, written about. Um, one of the, 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 you know, the original, part of the original proposal for a negative income tax was, you know, as a replacement for, um, for income support, for, the, for existing income support programs, and in particular, a replacement that would have stronger work, uh, work incentives, um, not, uh, you know, not negative work incentives. Um, and so that's, that, that, that was the original motivation and kind of why we wanted to explore this. And um, we just wondered if maybe this literature, which has been so like caught up um, on, on the adverse or negative labor supply uh, implications of a negative income tax, uh, has has maybe missed um, something uh, for the, the those individuals that are not working um, and are um, made the NIT offer if they're randomly assigned to the treatment group. Okay, so that's our starting point. Uh, very quickly, um, if you haven't looked at this literature in a little while, here is sort of our starting point in terms of the consensus view of what we've learned. Uh, from the negative income tax experiments, at least with respect to labor supply. So the, the, uh, all of the North American experiments um, uh, focused on th uh, these demographic groups. So husbands and wives, <laughs> and, and, and that was the, it, it's actually been, it, it's, it's fun going back and looking at these and having the 1970s terminology. Um, but that sort of the husbands and wives in the two head uh, households, and then single parents. And the single parents are, are, are um, uh, not surprisingly, uh, overwhelmingly uh, single moms. And actually, because we follow the existing literature, we focus on, sing on single female heads. There, there's, a, there's a handful of, um, uh, of single dads, that, and we just exclude them, but it's a trivial number. Um, and welfare programs in so of course for the AFDC, we're I mean the the single female head group um, essentially um, is the only group eligible for uh, for for benefits. In Canada, it was a little bit different, but certainly the single female head group is uh, was overwhelmingly um, recipients of the the Canadian welfare programs. Um, you could but you could be eligible actually if you were uh, if you were a two head. Um, household uh, with kids, um, but uh, receipt in that group is is, is fairly low. Um, so, so what we we're going to do is we're going to reassess these experiments, and we're going to focus on the ones that had single parents um, uh, eligible for them. So that rules out, for example, New Jersey. So we're not going to look at New Jersey because there were no single um, <clears throat> parents in New Jersey. We're also going to leave out the rural one because it's just there's just not enough observations. So we're gonna look at Gary, Indiana, uh, Syme Dime, which from now on, I'm gonna separate, um, as, as I'm sure some of you know, because you know that literature, Syme Dime always get pooled together. Um, uh, we're gonna argue that that may not be the best approach. Uh, so I'm gonna, from this point forward, refer to them as Seattle and Denver separately. And then we're gonna look at the Canadian experiment, which was done in the, the province of Manitoba. Um, not too far from Wisconsin, actually, if my North American geography is 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 correct. Um, and that experiment was called Mincom. Now, the so our starting point here in terms of what happened to labor supply in these experiments was that uh, we had fairly, probably not huge, although that seemed to be the narrative at the time. But um, you know, certainly non-trivial uh, negative labor supply effects, uh, in particular on hours worked, maybe a little bit less on the, on the probability um, of working, uh, but certainly for hours worked in all, of, uh, in all four of these um, income maintenance experiments. Now, uh, the results for Gary have always been kind of tenuous. And I'm actually, for today's talk, because I'm, uh, because I'm at a practice and I went way over time, in uh, the grad seminar this morning, I, I only got through two thirds of my material. Um, I at least anticipated this a little bit. So I'm, I'm gonna leave Gary out a bit um, and won't talk too much about them. Those results are in the paper. Um, and the new version of the paper, actually Seattle also takes a little bit of a backseat, but I'm gonna talk a bit about um, the Seattle experiment today. Uh, so the results were always kind of tenuous in Gary, but certainly in Manitoba, the Canadian one and in Seattle and Denver, 
um, there, uh, uh, quite strong uh, evidence of negative labor supply effects. And there I have a quote from you, uh, from Weiderquist, and, and I, I chose this quote in particular because it kind of emphasizes the consensus view for single female hands. So the response of wives and single mothers was larger than for husbands. Wives reduced their workout by zero to 27% and single mothers by 15 to 30%. The reason for the ranges there is just that that's just the ranges across different studies. So that's kind of where our starting point. And um, I should probably review key findings. Um, uh, I believe uh, you are all in person. So maybe people have to leave to, to go teach. Um, so uh, this is these are just kind of the key findings. So the first thing is um, uh, we go through randomization um, quite carefully. Uh, that hasn't been uh, done before. Um, and what we find is that randomization actually failed in Gary and Seattle. I'm gonna focus on uh, Seattle in the talk and we'll, we'll go through a little bit about that. Um, there is a large literature on misreporting of income and attrition bias. Um, and so I'm going to kind of skip over a little bit of that. I'll talk about attrition bias a little bit, but this possibility of randomization failure, uh, uh, we haven't been able to find it. I think we've been through the literature quite um, extensively and other people that have, that have commented on our paper um, seem to be on board with uh, this. Um, so we think that's, um, Important and and, and, as, and and because of that, we're going to uh, we're going to kind of we're going to largely leave Gary and Seattle in the background. So something because there are some people, I'm actually not sure I I completely agree with this. Um, and if you have or are interested in the original working paper, it's an IZA uh, working paper, and uh, um, some non-experimental results on Seattle are in there. I think they're quite informative, but the paper has kind of gone the direction of of leaving Gary and Seattle out. And that is, um, you know, we have a, 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 a group of economists uh, today where the kind of the view is if, if, uh, if the randomized control trial, um, you know, has been demonstrated to not be reliable in some way, such as, for example, if randomization wasn't done correctly, then we just need to sort of leave it out and move on from it. So I'll talk a little bit about Seattle, but they're not going to be a part of the main results. And then the second thing, uh, the second key finding is we're going to focus on dime and we're going to we're going, we're going to subsample into two groups the group that, uh, that were receiving uh, welfare benefits uh, prior to random assignment and then the second and these are two mutually exclusive groups the way we're going to define it and we'll talk all about that um, and then ver versus the worker group so people that are working and we're going to we're going to we're going to um, you know estimate treatment effects for these two groups uh, separately and and ask the question, um, uh, are, is the labor supply response um, different, which, you know, which theoretically um, uh, there's, you know, there's good reason to believe that it could be. For Manitoba, this is the first go through Manitoba for single parents. Um, so, um, so we're going to, we're going to look at that. And overall, what we're going to find is actually, we, uh, we find no support for the consensus view that, um, that single moms reduce work effort. So that's for the overall uh, kind of sample. What we do find uh, for dime, and this ends up being consistent with uh, the, the results for the Canadian experiment, I'll explain that in more detail later. What we find though, is that there is important heterogeneity in the treatment effect. Um, So in particular, uh, the way that the results look to go is that for, uh, for welfare recipients, we find positive effects on labor supply. For workers, we find the, the, the similar results to what the literature finds for the wives from the two heads, and that is a reduction in hours work. These, these, these two largely cancel each other out. Um, I'll be more specific later. And, uh, and, so, and so that kind of gets us to this, uh, this kind of pooled, treatment effect that is essentially, you know, very close to zero. In our work, we find statistically indistinguishable uh, from zero. There are some differences between uh, our work and the Sondheim final report. Uh, those are in 
the new version of the paper. If people are interested, be happy to send that along. But it would, it, I think it's going to go beyond the scope of my time uh, today to go through that. The other source of heterogeneity that ends up being very important is in terms of the nature of the treatment that uh, uh, that you were offered. So as I'll show you uh, soon, the, the, uh, there wasn't just one treatment; there were a variety of plans with different with different you know financial uh, parameters in terms of the amount of the benefit and what the tax rate was on your labor earnings. And so we explore that heterogeneity, and it's quite important. Uh, and ultimately, what we find is that the positive labor supply response for non-workers, the welfare recipient group, is being driven by exactly the plans that theory tells us should be that that should be higher work incentive um, um, parameters. Okay, so I'll uh, just a little bit of background. I will try and go through this um, uh, quickly. Uh, this. I wasn't 100% sure who my audience was here. So, um, um, because I know the Institute is multidisciplinary, so I thought maybe just a little bit of background might be helpful. So, we're going to start here. This is uh, figure one, and this is your classic textbook, you know, labor economics textbook uh, treatment of neg a negative income tax. Um, so, this is the, you know, I think. I, I feel it's fair to say that this is sort of the what what many people viewing the negative income tax literature have in the back of their of their minds in terms of the the uh, the work disincentives of a negative income tax. So what we have here in the uh, th this contemplates uh, the offer of a negative income tax or the introduction of a negative income tax, you know, at a jurisdiction level, um, when there's no pre-existing income support. Uh, system and so that, that that's unrealistic. But this is your kind of most basic starting point. So the negative income tax involves the guarantee. Uh, that's the distance AC, and um, and then the the budget constraint there AF. Um, that that's uh, that is your the slope of that is your is is the individual's wage rate. And then when, when we have this, this negative income tax offer, the negative income tax has a guarantee, kind of like a, like a welfare benefit, like under AFDC. Um, but then it also has this tax rate on your labor earnings. So that's going to change the slope. Um, and so we have CT as the, um, the slope associated with the negative income tax offer to the treatment group. Okay. And the simple point here is to show um, the, the you know the substitution effect versus the income effect for how you know we expect behavior to uh, labor supply behavior um, for people offered the treatment group or people who take up the offer uh, to to uh, to respond and so the we can kind of see the thing about the the negative income tax is the substitution effect and the income effect they they both go in the same direction so for the substitution effect you know we're holding utility constant at u not um, and, but we have the, uh, the, the, the dash line is the, is, is, um, I think it looks parallel there. It's certainly supposed to be parallel, uh, to the, uh, to the wage rate, um, uh, under the NIT. So that's your wage rate times one minus the tax rate. So th those slopes are parallel. And so we can see the substitution effect there, which involves E to E prime holding constant utility. So the substitution effect uh, suggests that people will reduce their hours work because they're gonna to substitute towards um, leisure. And then the income effect from the guarantee uh, is the movement from E, uh, uh, is, is the new equilibrium at E double primed. And the income effect, of course, all, um, as, as we know, it involves uh, also working less because you have more money, so you want to buy more of everything, and including leisure. So the classic case involves uh, an unambiguous reduction in labor supply. Um, and so, with this in mind, I think the the, the consensus estimate seems very natural because um, we kind of think about a negative income tax as being as involving work disincentives. Notice that this is for workers, though. Uh, right, because the original equilibrium point is at E. So people are, and, and you know, uh, sorry, I should have defined the axis for, uh, for people. Your Y axis is income and your X axis is hours worked. So this is for people with positive hours worked. Um, if you're collecting, say, 100% leisure, you're not working, you're a non-worker, you're at point A. So now let's look at the other cases. 
So figure two, here what we have is, um, we have um, the, the guarantee under the negative income tax is AB, and we're gonna have a tax rate here, same as before. So here the new, uh, uh, in figure two, the new budget constraint under the negative income tax offer is, um, is a, uh, ABEF. And what we wanna imagine here uh, in figure two is a negative income tax with low generosity. So here, what we wanna think about is a guarantee um, which uh, in subsequent tables, I'm gonna call that G. So when you, when you see G, you just think that's the guarantee associated with negative income tax. Um, that's gonna be just A, B. Okay. Um, and this is gonna be equivalent to, in this case, we wanna think about this as a, as, as a low generosity guarantee because this is gonna be equivalent to welfare benefits. So in this case, we're no longer uh, kind of being unrealistic and thinking about introducing an NIT uh, when there are, when there when there's no income support system, so here here we have an income support system already exists. Um, so individuals could receive welfare benefits, and then we have an NIT offer being made. But the guarantee is a low generosity guarantee, and in particular, the guarantee is at the same level as existing welfare benefits. Okay, and this is an important case because what we're, what we what was what was true in the negative income tax experiments is that for some individuals in the treatment group. The, uh, the, the plan that they were offered was, uh, uh, was either at or actually below, especially early in the experiment, was below um, existing income support. Um, a footnote to that that I think is pretty important is that food stamps were taxed at 100% on um, if you were in the treatment group and you took up the NIT offer. So it's not just AFDC benefits that you want to think about as the comparison level of income support. You want to think of it as um, AFDC plus food stamps. Okay. It was a little bit different in Canada. And if we have time, we'll talk about that. So here, um, the same exercise in terms of thinking about the substitution effect um, and the income effect. So the substitution effect, we want to we just want to uh, hold constant utility at U naught. So this is movement from B to E on a in difference curve U naught. And so notice that, and then the income effect is movement from E to E prime. So the income effect, of course, reduces hours worked as the income effects do, but the substitution effect here is it works towards increasing uh, work. Um, and, in, and in this case, the substitution effect is much larger than the income effect. So um, here we get, an in, we get increased participation in the labor market and increase in hours worked. Um, the substitution effect dominates uh, for two reasons. First, because uh, the guarantee equals AB, so the guarantee is at the level of existing income support. Um, there's no income effect from um, a higher guarantee, a higher guarantee level. And then second, at the original equilibrium B, right? So notice, so B is is the case of the non-worker, someone who is collecting uh, exclusively collecting uh, welfare benefits. Um, so for that person, the income effect term in the, in the Slutsky equation, which I don't have uh, written down, um, but if we want to th uh, think about that, um, its weight on initial hours of work is so uh, is, is, is just very small. So it's, it's actually zero for a, like an, an infinitesimal change in, in the neighborhood of B, um, or it's just going to be really small for a discrete change away from B. So the, the bottom line for figure two is that um, is that the substitution effect um, is going to dominate the income effect. And so there's reason to believe for someone that is originally not working at point B that they would increase um, their labor supply. Um, and let's see, I wonder if I, I might um, move on from, uh, I think I'll move, I think I'll move on. I'm looking at my time too. And I don't want to run out of time for the, 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 the good stuff, which is the results. Um, so that just sets up, uh, I wanted to set up the stage there for the classic negative income tax case, which is what we're thinking about in terms of there being work disincentives, but how that's um, uh, 
not the case for someone who is not working at the beginning um, of the experiment and say is, is, is um, exclusively uh, on incomes, on the income, the prevailing income support system. Um, so very quickly, some just some background uh, for people who are not familiar with the NITs, or it has been a little while since you've looked at them. Here are the four uh, that we look at in the paper and various information on them. What I'm just going to focus on here is the final column under NIT treatment plans. So there, that just shows you that, that there's different levels of guarantee. The guarantees in this table are the, the, the uh, are, are expressed as a percentage of the of the poverty line, as opposed to the absolute um, amounts. Uh, you'll see the absolute amounts uh, later in the talk, and then you can also see the differing tax rates. So, uh, so this is just meant to to ensure you have in the back of your mind that there's this heterogeneity in the plan that was offered. Um, to members of the treatment group. So there was different levels of generosity of the guarantee and also different uh, tax rates. And the tax rates were actually in the case of, in the US case, uh, well, for Seattle and Denver were complex because some of the tax rates were a function of your, of your labor earnings. Um, so there's, um, so the sort of the more you worked or the, or, and or the, the higher uh, a wage you were able to achieved the lower the, the the tax rate so it was um so that's why uh, that, that's why some of those tax rates are in parentheses that's based but what i'm showing you there is the range of tax rates based on it's based on the um the highest tax rate to and, and the lowest tax rate is using the 95th percentile of labor earnings uh that that we see in the data it's just meant to give you an idea of, of, of the full range of tax rates that could be there. Um, so we have a low of around 50% um, under the fixed plans, but for people that were on these variable plans, depending on, on the amount you worked and what your wage rate was, um, you could be down as low as, as a 40% as a tax rate. As I mentioned, I believe I mentioned earlier at this time period, uh, there was already a reduced tax rate under AFDC um, at 67%. There could be state variation um, in that. Um, there's, there, there's some discussion of that in the paper. Um, but at least on paper, um, the tax rate was at 67%. So notice that for, for some treatment group members, their tax rate would actually go up if they took up the NIT um, offer. Okay, a little bit about data before we look at some basic summary statistics and talk about the, 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 the group of individuals that are involved in these experiments. So Manitoba is actually a bit uh, tricky. Um, uh, to make a long story short, essentially they ran out of money. And so um, the full data has never been digitized. Um, there was never a final report. That, that's, that, that's, a, that's a key difference between the Canadian experiment and all the US experiments. Um, as you know, for these large social experiments, we're used to there being kind of a final report published, and that kind of becomes the, the basis of, you know, of our knowledge and the consensus kind of, uh, you know, uh, treatment effects that everybody sort of knows about. Um, so that was never the case for the Canadian experiment. There is no final report. There's just one paper, um, and a paper that we haven't been able to replicate at, at all. Um, so uh, we use in this paper, I'm in the middle right now of putting together the full data set from the archival records. Um, but that won't be in this, in this particular paper. In this paper, what we use is what data is available, um, which um, is pretty decent. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be fairly comparable uh, to the Seattle, Denver um, data. We've got uh, the, a baseline survey, so we can look at, uh, at, at um, treatment group and the control group at the baseline. Um, and then we have a set of periodic uh, surveys uh, the, the time frame you want to think in mind here, there's, there's nine of them. They're done about um, uh, every four months. So it's about a three-year period. In the Canadian experiment, there is no post-treatment data, unlike um, Seattle and Denver. So in Seattle and Denver, um, at least for individuals that were on the three-year program, there were two different programs. Um, what's, 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 what's nice about those data is you can observe um, people's labor market outcomes after their eligibility, for, like after the experiment is over for them. So after the, the, the NIT offers is no longer um, there. 
uh, what we uh, what we dug up that hasn't been used uh, before um, uh, on the on the, the Canadian experiment was also some admin data. So there was some administrative data that was collected. One thing the Canadian experiment did uh, differently from the U.S. experiments is they had a separate agency uh, called Mincom Payments that handled all of the payment part of so paying people the the, the guarantee, the payment part of um, uh, of the treatment process. Um, and they also did uh, did taxes for the people in the treatment group who took up the offer. Um, so there's this there's this admin data from that group. It only has your earnings. There's no there's no information on hours worked. So for, so for that data, we're only going to be able to look at the likelihood of of employment. Um, but it's a it's a it's a I think it's a useful robustness check. The sample is small in the Manitoba experiment. It was not as big as, as Seattle and Denver, which were um, the largest of the NIT experiments. Um, but we've got some uh, an extra group of single parents in there. Uh, for Seattle and Denver, this data might be known uh, more. So maybe I'll go just, I'll just mention quickly, it, it's a different looking data set in that it's monthly data. Um, the actual source of labor market information is the same in all of these. It's all based on people uh, on asking people to report their start and end dates um, of work. Uh, but what happened in Seattle and Denver, same with Gary, uh, was um, the, the consulting group that put together the data, the name escapes right now, I bet we have people in the audience so that knows it. Um, they, uh, they compiled the monthly um, labor market information based on those start and end dates. So the data that is publicly available, I, I, I believe it's the only data that's available for Seattle and Denver. You want to think of it as basically a 72 month panel. What's interesting about the Seattle and Denver and Gary experiments is that um, the because of the way the, the surveys were collected, coupled with the fact that they were like a lot of big social experiments had staggered entry, um, what you end up with in these data sets is variation across uh, observations in uh, the amount of pre-random assignment and post-random assignment for some people data that you have. So everybody's experiment is obviously of the same length. Um, so if you're in the three-year group, you're, uh, you're, the, the panel uh, for the experimental time is 36 uh, months, three years, um, or five years for the five-year group. Most of the data, though, is in the three-year group. Um, but the length of the panel for your pre-random assignment period and post-random assignment period varied across the sample. So in particular, um, in Seattle and Denver, there's between 9 and 19 months of pre-random assignment data. If you had more pre-random assignment data, you had less post-experiment data uh, and, and, and vice versa. Uh, the key issue, which takes up a bunch of time in the paper, but I, I don't think uh, we need to spend any uh, much time on it all here, um, that we found just in our starting point was just to, to try and replicate the results from the Simon Dime final report. Um, and I think the, the key issue is on how to define a single female head. Uh, that ends up being actually quite tricky because the types of house, the types of family structures that were in this data actually were. Um, uh, were complex. And we find that there's actually a fair amount of individuals, of uh, women classified as single female heads, but there was actually no dependent child. So no kids 16 or under. Um, so for example, two sisters or a mom with an adult child and so on and so forth. So um, we're only going to be looking at uh, single female heads with dependent children. That's our sample um, in all experiments. Uh, just some summary statistics. Let's just uh, keep this brief and just get a sense of what the labor market, um, the past labor market, pre-random assignment labor market characteristics uh, were. So this is all pre-random assignment data or baseline data. I might not refer to it as baseline data because this is these characteristics are measured over the entire pre-random assignment uh, period. Um, so we can see that the uh, let's just look at columns uh, or sorry rows two and three uh, we can see that one thing just to notice is that gary really stands out gary was a very um uh a different population um so there's much less work in gary welfare receipt doesn't look 
um, too much higher. That's in row one, two, three, four, uh, row, row, um, row five. So welfare receipt is at 80%, um, 0.797 there, if you can see that in the Gary column. Uh, for receiving welfare at least one month, uh, definitely higher, but uh, just notice uh, um, how different the, the, the labor, labor market patterns are uh, for Gary relative to the other experiments. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is based on employment, it looks like the Canadian experiment looks quite similar to Seattle and Denver. So you can see uh, for employed at least one month, they're all kind of in the 60 you know, to 70% range, but do notice uh, how different hours worked is. Um, so there was some you know, there was some labor market attachment in, in the Canadian experiment, but hours worked is substantially lower than Seattle and, and, uh, and Denver. Okay. And you can see there is, uh, there, there's quite a bit of welfare receipt in there. Um, and, you, and you can also just notice if we compare receiving welfare at least one month versus receiving welfare every month, you can kind of, uh, you, you can see there's also some kind of either movement on or off welfare over the pre-random assignment period, not surprisingly. Um, there also could be some combining work and welfare um, in a given month as well, since there wasn't earnings disregard. Okay, okay so that gives you a sense of, of our participant uh, group across the different experiments. Okay, so the random assignment process. So random assignment was peculiar. Um, in these uh, experiments, uh, at least I found it. <laughs> I found it peculiar um, being used to more uh, modern experiments. So the way random assignment was done was using this this, this Conlisk Watts model, which essentially assigned people to the treatment group uh, and control group based on their income. Now it was a it was a probability based model, so you weren't just sort of automatically. Um, assigned uh, to a particular plan, um, but your it was, it was your likelihood of being assigned to a particular plan that was a function of your income. the The reason for this was just to, it was really budgetary, um, and it was just uh, that you know if we had really low income individuals um, randomly assigned to the most generous plan, that would be more expensive than we would need. So if, if we had uh, you know the lowest income group, we don't really need to um, uh, to incentivize them to take up the offer by 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 um, assigning them the most generous plan. Uh, that would you know that would sort of be um, um, I guess an excessive use of funds when there is a budget constraint here for um, for the experiment. That that that's 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 in essence. Um, I hope that makes sense. I can't see people, whether people are nodding or shaking their heads at me. Um, um, I hope that makes sense. So that, that's, that, that's the basic idea of it. Um, so, but what, what this means, the, the, the key thing I wanna emphasize here, what this means is that, um, is that in, in just, if you wanna think of this as working with like a pool data set on an experiment, we can't just compare the treatment group and the control group. Well, we can, but, 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 but the point is, is that we would expect them to differ um, so you wouldn't, you normally we wouldn't expect that under random assignment, the treatment group and the control group should be, you know, should be, um, uh, the same, uh, because, um, uh, the random assignment process is, you know, that's statistically independent from, um, everything from potential outcomes and everything else. Um, here, because of the nature of this assignment model, we, we expect the treatment group and the control group, uh, to differ because the assignment process, you know, is based on your, on your past income level. Um, and income wasn't the only, uh, stratification that was, that was used. Um, uh, uh they also used, uh, family type. Now that's not going to be important for our presentation today because we're only focusing on single female heads, but just so that uh, you're aware, um, and then also, uh, race. So in Seattle, uh, uh, white and blacks and in, in Denver, um, uh, Hispanics were the third group. Um, race was not a stratification in the Canadian experiment. Um, location was also um, a stratification level in two of the experiments and program length for Seattle uh, and Denver. So whether you were in the three-year or five-year program. So there are multiple, um, so random assignment was done, was done based on multiple um, stratification levels, income, 
for, for all of them income. That's the core of the Conless Watts model, but then also uh, race, program length, location, depending on the specific experiment that we're talking about. So it means from the standpoint of thinking about randomization, um, and as we'll move on to next here, like doing balancing tasks and looking to see if the treatment group and the control group look to be, comp uh, look to be identical um, at the time of random assignment, it means that we have to control for all of these stratification groupings, um, which, is, which is pretty common now in like the development experiments, uh, the experiments they do in development economics, um, but uh, which I didn't know until I started looking at that. Um, but in labor market experiments that, that would, uh, you know, this, other than the NITs, this is not something we see too often, at least uh, the experiments that, that, that um, I was familiar with, um, this, this didn't occur. So the, um, um, probably the simplest way to think about this is that the income, the, the negative income tax experiments weren't one big experiment. But instead, they were a, a set of what we call in the paper mini experiments, right? So, for example, um, the way random assignment was done is let's take Seattle, three year program for Caucasians, um, for single moms. That is an experiment. And then we have another experiment, which is, say, Seattle um, uh, Blacks. Um, a uh, five-year program for single moms and, and so on and so forth. So we have a whole set of these mini experiments and it's really at the mini experiment level that random assignment was done. So as, 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 um, as you can see then, if we're gonna do uh, balancing tests, we then need to do it at the mini experiment level. So we need a, you know, we need a, we need a set of fixed effects for um, each one of those mini experiments. And, um, and so that that wasn't that wasn't done in the uh, in this uh, either in the final reports uh, for Gary or Seattle or for Denver or in the early literature. Um, the first people that that really pointed this out carefully um, was a paper in 1990 by Orly Ashenfelter and, and a co-author. So uh, so they looked at um, they looked at the two heads group. Um, Seattle and Denver combined and pointed this out and said, you know, to do this properly, uh, what we need to do is we need to look at each mini experiment and then figure out a way to aggregate them up. Um, the way we would do this now, which is what you're going to see um, next, is, um, is we're, we're going to pool the data, but we're going to have, you know, fixed effects in there for each mini experiment. So what we argue in the paper, and we haven't had, um, uh, uh, we hope we've been through the literature carefully. We haven't had any uh, pushback. Uh, most people that have looked at it seem to agree with us. It's tough because, I, as I mentioned in the motivation, this literature, the the literature on the negative income tax experiments is just so massive. It's 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 like hard to be confident that you've caught everything. But we can't find any um, uh, anyone anything that's looked at balancing tests. Certainly people looked at treatment group versus control group in the early literature, but, um, um, and, 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 the, and, the, and the point was made many times in the early literature that we expect the control group and the treatment group to differ. Um, but, but it was kind of left at that. Uh, we never sort of asked the question, okay, once we've you know, accounted for the fact that, that, that the assignment model is a function of these stratification groups, um, uh, are, the, you know, are the treatment group and the control group the same? Um, and so today, that's that, that's a standard thing to do with experimental data is to do these balancing tests and ask whether or not they look, um, you know, randomly assigned. Um, now, it may be the case that it was always assumed randomiz randomization would be done correctly. After all, why, if, if we're doing an experiment, how could randomization not be done correctly? Um, I get that asked that question uh, quite a bit. And uh, the thing is, is there, there are some reasons to believe that randomization may not have been done correctly, and here they are. Um, the, the, the first one is what, is, is what kind of I focus on uh, uh, here today, and I think has become the focus of the paper, because um, I, I don't know, we're, we just feel interested in feedback on this, but we feel this is the, the, the most compelling reason. Um, so as you um, 
as you may know, uh, especially if you're from the West Coast, this was uh, a difficult time period for Seattle. It was also a difficult time for, period for Gary. So both, both cities were essentially single employer cities at, at that time period. Um, obviously not today for Seattle, but it was back then. So Seattle was, was Boeing and, um, and Gary was, uh, was, was steel and in particular, uh, one employer in particular. And, um, and both economies collapsed right as these experiments were starting. In fact, a little less widely known, Denver was started only because there was a concern that the Seattle experiment would be, um, I don't, I don't think the word contaminated was ever used, but anyway, and, and, but for lack of a better word, and that's probably not the right word, but for lack of a better word, that the Seattle experiment would be somehow uh, contaminated or the results wouldn't be sufficiently informative from the policy standpoint because of the collapse of Boeing. So Boeing came close to going bankrupt. Um, and we have an appendix that goes through um, all of that for people that are interested. In. Um, and this happened exactly when random assignment was occurring. So then they decided to add Denver. Um, and what we find when we look at uh, the data is that um, the way they did the surveys um, at the time of random assignment was a little bit different than what we uh, than what I've seen in most experiments today. And that was that the control group was 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 their, their baseline was entirely um, in one month. Um, whereas the treatment group, they did the sur their, their baseline surveys. So before the, 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 the treatment, the NIT treatment is offered to the treatment group, those were staggered over a year. And that was an important year because basically Seattle is collapsing during that year. And as I'll show you in the next slide, what we, 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 uh, and as, as you already know from, the, from when I preluded, preluded the findings at the beginning, we find that, that the balancing tests fail for Seattle and Gary. Um, and in particular in Seattle for the three-year group, what we find is that people had quite substantial, uh, treatment group had quite substantially different earnings, hours worked and welfare receipt and employment rates. Um, and one, one plausible explanation for that is uh, that there were these differences in basically when we were measuring this stuff. So even though it's pre-randomization for everybody, um, and correlates to when their experiment starts in experimental time. In calendar time, we're measuring people at different points um, in terms of economic conditions and, and really, really severe economic conditions. It's in the paper, uh, this stuff I wrote too long ago to remember now, but I think we're, we're talking like an unemployment rate that might have peaked 20% in the Puget Sound area. So, uh, um, so I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that, you know, Seattle is kind of collapsing um, in terms of the labor market and the, the, the economy in general. Um, I'm worried about my time. So I'm gonna skip over reasons number two and three, but um, you probably already read them. There were also reasons that are specific to this Conlisk Watts model that were that were problematic, that were acknowledged in the original literature. Um, and this was true in the Canadian experiment as well. So this model kind of requires a certain number of treatments and controls in each one of these stratification cells. Um, and they had trouble finding the right number, um, especially in terms of income. All of the experiments kind of didn't have, uh, and, and if you go back, look at the summary statistics, um, if, uh, if, if you have the slides, uh, if they're being passed around, um, you'll notice that the fraction of the participants across the different income stratification groups looks wildly different. And that's one reason why. Um, we don't know, we haven't been able to figure out uh, for certain if, if, if uh, anyone has um, uh, suggestions on this, that'd be uh, fantastic. We haven't been able to figure out for certain the connection between the, the problems they had um, uh, finding the right number of people uh, for, for the treatment group and the control group in each one of these uh, cells. And we haven't been able to connect that to random assignment failing, um, which is why I kind of find um, the first reason there the most uh, um, uh, compelling. So let's look, at, let's look at these balancing tests then. Um, the, the first one here is from Manitoba. And what I've done, uh, we've got this in the paper now to try and uh, make it clear to the reader uh, why 
working at the mini experiment level. So having, you know, having those fixed effects in there for each stratification is so important. So what I'm showing you here is, is a set of labor market characteristics um, um, bef before random assignment. Each, each one of those cells you're looking at there is just the coefficient, uh, it's just the difference in means between the treatment group and the control group. Um, so those should be zero, um, uh, or at least statistically indistinguishable from zero. And then, and then you've also got the, 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 the mean there. And uh, what I'm showing you, so I'm looking at uh, columns uh, you know, two and three. Um, so the difference between treatments and controls with and without these experimental stratification groups. Now for, for, Manitoba, uh, for the Canadian experiment, Manitoba, that's easy because there was only one and that was the income cell. More complex for the US experiments. And what you can see is that um, with the, uh, with the control for the income cell, um, all those differences in means, some of them are actually look non-trivial in size, but anyway, none of them are statistically different from zero. If you look at the differences in means in all of these labor market characteristics without controlling for the income cell, we see all kinds of differences. And that's what was acknowledged uh, many times over in the early NIT literature because of the nature of the, the way random assignment was done with this Convus Watts uh, model. Uh, so this is just meant to illustrate that, you know, you, 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 have, to, um, um, you have to account for uh, the way that the, uh, the assignment process uh, was done if you're gonna look at differences between treatments and controls um, at the date of random assignment. Okay. So here is sign the Seattle income maintenance experiment. What we're looking at here is uh, monthly data, pre-random assignment data. I've got it months one to month nine. The reason for that choice, as I mentioned earlier, is that the, the number of the, the length of the panel um, varied across, across, the, uh, across the sample from nine months to 19 months. So we're showing nine months since everybody in the Seattle experiment had nine months of pre-random assignment data and um, uh, self-explanatory. So you can see that in the five year, uh, some of those differences in means, like, so again, each cell is a difference in means between treatment group and control group. You can see some of the differences in means for the five year Seattle are uh, look to be non-trivial in size, but, um, um, but they're all indistinguishable from zero. I should note the five year sample size is quite small. Um, most of the data is the three-year program. 70% of the data is the three-year program. But you can see in the three-year program, the treatment group has lower wages, more likely to be collecting uh, welfare, uh, maybe not completely systematically, but reasonably strong, uh, had less hours worked and were uh, less likely to be working. So across the board, look to have lower labor market uh, attachment and more use of income support. Um, but again, given um, the first reason for possible failure of randomization I, met, I mentioned on the previous slide, this group was surveyed, like this data is from a later point, this, this, from a later point in calendar time in the control group. Um, the control group was surveyed just at the beginning of Seattle collapsing. For some of these individuals, they're a year later, 10 months later, nine months later. Um, and so it's not surprising that they have, that, that um, they're more likely to be receiving unemployment insurance. They're, they're, they're uh, more likely to be receiving AFDC and they're less likely to be working because, because you know, um, Boeing and the rest of the Seattle economy is, is, is tanking. Um, I'll probably run out of time in my discussion at the end. I think there is an interesting conversation about how to think about. So the balancing task fails, but I think there's an interesting conversation to have around: is this a failure of random assignment, or is this um, is this better characterized as uh, as something else? So in other words, it might have been that the like the the analysts that were doing the assignment process, you, you know, in you know early 1970, it might have been that. If we had surveyed everybody at the same time, then they would have looked identical. But because of this, you know, but because of this um, kind of essentially post-randomization thing that happened, right, with 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 a, with a huge economic shock, and the fact that the that the um, 
that the baseline was uh, that, that that your that your entry into the experiment was staggered. It's that that created the the, the, the failure of the balancing test. Um, and so, for experimental people uh, in particular, um, um, I think there might be a there might be some sensitivity, some resistance on saying it's a failure of randomization. Um, and um, um, so anyway, I think there's a, I think there's, there's an interesting conversation there. The only other I thing I want to encourage you uh, to get us to the results before you run out of time. Okay. <laughs> um, this, uh, um, you know, there isn't that big, huge clock at the back of the lecture hall, so I have no idea. Um, okay, so I'll move ahead quickly. The one thing I'll mention, since this is the this is res, this is the first major result of the paper, so I'm at least not completely uh, behind the results. The one thing I'll mention here, since I'm not going to show anything else for Seattle, is that these pre-random assignment differences are basically the size of the treatment effects in the final report. So another way you can think about that is if you wanted to do a difference in difference on here, the effects in Seattle on labor supply when you account for these pre-random assignment differences is zero. We can skip over attrition. There's lots of literature on that. Okay, so here are the treatment effects for, so, uh, so from this point forward, we're going to focus on Denver and Manitoba um, since, the, since random assignment uh, passes the balancing tests in those. And what you can see here, starting with Manitoba, um, what we find is uh, in both the admin data and in the survey data, we find that the treatment group was um, for single female heads was more likely to be working and had higher hours worked. Uh, not super precise estimates because of course the sample size is small. In Denver, we can see that in the full sample, there is no statistically significant treatment effect. That's actually pretty close to, we come close to replicating the final report. Um, the, the treatment effects are a little bit larger in absolute value in the final report. Uh, we trace that to differences in the sample construction that I talked about earlier with, uh, um, with it being truly single female heads with dependent children. But, what, um, uh, but what's new in this uh, uh, relative to the existing literature is just the heterogeneity in, um, in your uh, welfare or work status pre-random assignment. So we can see there that among long-term welfare recipients, they're about 6.6 .6 percentage points more likely to be working, not very precise, but more monthly hours. This is a monthly panel, so you want to think about those hours coefficients as, as at the month level, but 15 more months an hour, uh, months worked an hour. Conversely, so that's, that's tracing that back to the theory, that's that figure two we talked about earlier. And then we can contrast that with the worker group, so people that are, this is the classic textbook negative income tax group who's working where it's you know, unambiguously the incentives are to reduce your hours worked. And, um, and, 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 and sure enough, that's exactly what we, we find. In fact, larger, you know, larger and more precise um, treatment effects than, than what's in the literature for Denver alone. Okay. Um, and you can also see that the, just the sizes of the treatment effects, these, now these two groups aren't identical in size. So keep that in mind. The worker group is larger. Um, the full sample obviously is a weighted average of the two. Um, but we can see that they, they, they're fairly comparable treatment effects. And so what we're kind of, what we what ultimately get is these, these two have just been offsetting each other and giving us kind of zero overall. And then the last thing I'm going to do here is just to look at heterogeneity in the treatment plan. And the reason here is that, um, I guess you can kind of view this as a bit of a robustness check. The, 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 the reason here is that different plans had different levels of work incentives or disincentives. Um, so the, 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 the setup I, sh I showed you at the beginning of the talk in that figure two, that was uh, where the substitution effect definitely dominates the income effect. That's, that's all, that only holds if the guarantee is low. Um, and in particular, if the guarantee is, is, is at the level of or below existing income support. Um, if, uh, clearly, if the guarantee is really generous, then uh, relative to existing income support, then, then that whole argument starts to fall apart. And it might, be, it might be ambiguous, or depending on how generous the guarantee is, it might be that the income effect dominates. So what we're going to do is just split the sample as best as we can, um, there's lots more on this in, in, in the paper for people that are interested, but we're gonna split it as best as we can given the sample sizes into the types of plans that involved higher work incentives. So those are, those are plans with like low guarantees that are at the level of AFDC and food stamps. Um, 
uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a lower tax rate versus the plans that are unlikely to have any work incentives, um, such as like a guarantee, uh, a really high guarantee that's going to have a big income effect, um, or a tax rate that say is above like the tax rate under AFDC, um, that wouldn't involve much of an incentive to work at all. Um, yeah, that's interesting, but I'm, I'm out of time. Maybe we can come back to it in questions in Q&A. Um, and so here is the results just split up. And what we can see here is that the um, I've got the plans grouped by guarantee and grouped by tax rate. Um, there's not enough data to do both. Um, I'll just focus on the plans grouped by guarantee. So the high work incentive plans here, those are, those are the plans with a guarantee that is at or below the level of AFDC plus food stamps. Um, and so those are the ones where, where, uh, where the substitution effect is going to dominate the income effect. And you can just see that all of the action is coming from those groups. Um, the coefficients are positive for the low work incentives, but anyway, they're, um, but, uh, they're pretty imprecise and um, basically just zero for, um, for the probability of employment. Um, so it is the high work incentive plans that seem to be um, driving the results. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is just a wrap up. Um, if I've um, articulated myself well, being unable to see, see to see anybody, um, we can probably uh, just uh, skip this and go to questions and answers. But basically, um, uh, what we find is that the the, the, the key overall result is uh, that we find that with the pool data, uh, there's really no consensus. There's there's no there's no negative labor supply effect, uh, which which was the consensus or the story. Um, Digging into that a bit more deeply, we see a, we see important heterogeneity, um, and in particular heterogeneity between um, individuals that were at the corner solution uh, and not working, um, and um, uh, collecting AFDC or Canadian welfare at the beginning of the experiment um, versus people who were working, um, and and ultimately the, the the workers as we would expect reduced labor supply. Um, it's about a 10 hour, 10% 10 increase, uh, decrease in, in, in hours worked. It's not very large. Um, and, uh, but then we get an increase in work activity for the group, uh, not working. And what's been kind of happening in the Denver income maintenance experiment is these two, uh, when we, when we've been looking at kind of the pool treatment effect, uh, that looks kind of close to zero ish, um, is it's just been kind of confounding these, these two opposing, um, behavioral responses. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to encourage folks to put questions into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we have just a few minutes, but I'll start with one. Um, so thinking about this and then the current conversations that have been happening, how do you think these, how should we think about these findings in relation to concerns about um, labor supply with various policy proposals? and the change in sort of welfare strategies that people, you know, the decline in TANF and such. Yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, very important, big, big picture question. Uh, and one that's come up a lot, I'm not sure. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll do one possible answer to this uh, in case there's other questions and because um, I'm, I would probably wouldn't have time. Um, so I guess the, uh, so it's so one thing to think about that certainly that we've had some pushback on from the standpoint of trying to, to, to push this as being informative to the current debate is that many of the policies that are look, being looking at now, certainly this is the case, I believe for all the US experiments, at least the ones that I know about, is they're basically all income effect things, um, right? It's just, it's, 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 it's here's some money. Um, and so on, on, on that, I, I would agree with, with, with that pushback. It's not clear this isn't that the negative income tax experiments are informative at all. Um, that being said, um, most of the careful, um, or my view of the careful, um, kind of thought pieces on what a basic income could, could, uh, could look like do include a negative income tax. And so I think, you know, I think it's, I think it's useful to know that even though welfare caseloads have, have declined substantially in both Canada and the U S, uh, that we would expect something different for people who are not working. Great, and um, Jeff has a question, so I'm gonna flip over um, and give him the ability to uh, talk. Jeff? 
Yes. Um, so, you know, you, in the in the GRO seminar, we talked about um, SSP and now and and sort of all its issues and uh, issues serious enough to change the interpretation. Now you've shown us that there's issues with some of the NIT experiments serious enough to change the interpretation. You tried to convince us that Project STAR has issues that are sufficient to change the interpretation. Uh, one can certainly write papers about all the many problems with the JTPA experiment. People have done that. Uh, I think there are papers one could write, and maybe I'll write one about the problems with the Workforce Investment Act gold standard evaluation. Um, is this, you know, is this something we should be setting students to do? Just say, go out, find another experiment and show that it's wrong? Is, is, or, or are we just getting lucky in the ones that we're looking at here? <laughs> what's, you know, like, what's the fraction of experiments that are overturnable. What is your what is your sense of that? I don't know. I'm batting a hundred, Jeff. <laughs> so that's it. You didn't you didn't take any other draws. Every every time you touch an experiment, it turns out that the consensus interpretation is wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, but now keep in mind, all for are for different reasons. Yes. Um, I, th I think that's important, right? It's not like. Um, you know, it's not like it's a randomization issue. Uh, each, each one has been um, has been uh, has, has been a different underlying issue. Um, so, and, and including Star, which I haven't done any work on Star. That, that's just informative, I think, um, for for the students um, and for anybody interested in, in, in education production functions. Uh, so, yeah, each one's different. And and but 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 yeah, I don't have. And in fact. Um, just since you've asked, I'll add on to this. There, there was also a post-randomization event in the NITs too. Um, so that's another paper. So the NITs actually had two problems with them. Um, so yeah, so I, I no, so, so back to your original question, I think we should have students doing this. Like I, um, in fact, I've been thinking of, I've had uh, students in my grad program evaluation course do replications on the experiments, but I'm actually thinking mm -hmm. of changing it to be, um, don't bother with the replication, do that in the econometrics class. Um, uh, go and go and dig up a reason why we should, you know, reassess this experiment. Cool. Okay, and with that, we're um, one minute over time already. So, Chris, I want to thank you. That was um, a great presentation, and I know we all learned a lot. Um, and we'll look forward to having you back to, to tear apart another randomized experiment uh, when, when we can travel. <laughs> so thank you. Be happy to. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.